Hey everyone, Steve here again with another random video. In this video, I'll be showing how I converted a dead PC, specifically a Windows XP machine, into a virtual machine. The motivation behind this video was related to one of my childhood PCs I held onto over the years. I pulled it out of storage one day to tinker with, and when I tried booting it up, I didn't have a boot screen. I tried different troubleshooting methods to get it working again, but was unsuccessful at getting it to post. Luckily, the hard drive on the PC still worked, and I had some experience from my job converting legacy systems into virtual machines. So, I'll try to share my knowledge on this topic so no one else has to lose a valuable system like me. Before beginning, we'll need some hardware and software to help bring this PC back to life. For hardware, we'll need an external drive enclosure for the extracted hard drive. Since my hard drive is from the early 2000s, it relies on the IDE interface for data transfer instead of SATA. Check the connection on your hard drive so you get the right enclosure. For software, we'll need three items. The first, SysInternals disk to VHD tool to convert the physical drive into a VHD virtual image. Second, the free version of Starwind V2V converter to convert the image made by SysInternals tool into another image called a VMDK image. And lastly, the software that allows to run the hard drive image on our PC as a virtual machine. For this video, I'll be using VMware Workstation Player. Windows has its own built-in virtual machine software called Hyper-V, but I prefer this product for its ability to easily connect peripherals to a virtual machine. Although, I suggest reviewing the system requirements before using this software. With that bit of information out of the way, let's get started. Starting with prepping our host PC, or the computer that will be running our virtual environment, we need to make sure that it can run hosting software in the first place. On most consumer computers, there's a saying in the BIOS or UEFI settings that allows a system to share system resources with one or more virtual machines. On most Intel systems, the saying would be listed as Intel Virtual Technology with an additional saying called VT-D. On AMD systems, which is what my host PC is using, the saying would be listed under AMD SVM Technology, SVM Mode, or some variation of that name. The setting is usually not enabled by default, so you'll have to go into your computer's BIOS or UEFI settings to turn it on. All PC manufacturers have different means to get into the system settings, so you'll have to research for your own system on how to enable it. I'll place a link in the description of an article on typical ways to get into the settings. Once that setting is in place, we can proceed with conversion. With the software this to VHD, download and extract it. Before connecting the enclosure, I prefer to look at the current drives and partitions on the host system so I know what to avoid when creating a virtual image. So, we'll run the software without the enclosure first. Open the unzipped folder and select the executable for your system. Since I'm using a 64-bit operating system on my host machine, I'll use the executable name this to vhd 64exe When the program window opens, it should list the current drives and partitions connected to your system. Make note of what you have connected to avoid adding that drive or partition to the image. When you've recorded that, close the software and connect the enclosure to the host system. When the drive is recognized by Windows, run disk to VHD again. When disk to VHD is running, in the section called Volumes to Include, unselect all drives and partitions that appear except for your newly added enclosure. In the area of the window with the check boxes, make sure the box labeled Prepare for Use in Virtual PC is the only box selected. For the section VHD file name, name and place where you want to store the virtual image. For this demonstration, I chose to place it on my desktop since it wasn't a large image. With all that configured, I clicked on the Create button and waited as the software converted my external drive into a virtual image file. This process only took a couple minutes for me and the file size was close to 7 gigabytes, but your wait time and file size will depend on the size of the drive. When I was finished, I closed out this to VHD. To make the image we created work with Workstation Player, we need to convert the VHD image into another format called a VMDK image with Starwind Converter. So, after downloading and installing, run Starwind Converter. After giving the app administrative access, in the window to select the location of the image to convert, select the option Local File. After clicking Next, find the VHD image that was recently created. For me, I placed it on my desktop. Make a note of the file size in the lower left pane for later. On the next screen to select the location of the destination file, select Local File again and Next. 
For the destination image format, select VMDK and Next. For the VMDK image format option, I kept the option to make the image a global image. For the destination file name, I saved it to my desktop again for simplicity. Make a note again of what you name the image. After that, I clicked the convert button and waited for the software to finish. The process only took a couple minutes for me, but your mileage may vary. When Starwind was done, I closed it and had the VMDK image on my desktop. To make things a little tidier, I placed all the image files I created into a folder. I made a separate folder to store the old VHD file. I recommend saving it. Also, make a copy of the VMDK image we just created and keep it with the old VHD file. I'll go over that near the end of the video. Now that the image file is converted, we can start using VMware Workstation Player. Before we can run the newly converted image, we need to create a file within VMware called a VMX file that tells the program the virtual hardware setup, like how much RAM, CPU cores, network connectivity, and more. To do this, we need to go through a setup process of a new virtual machine in VMware. For files produced in this setup, I'm placing them in a temporary folder on my desktop called Test. If you haven't yet, install and open VMware Workstation Player. In the menu bar under Player, go to File, New Virtual Machine. At the next window for installing the guest operating system, I chose the BOM option to install the operating system later and the Next button. At the next screen, I went through the options to select Windows XP Home Edition as my guest operating system. This is only specific to my desktop I'm trying to recover. You'll have to change this if you have a different version of the OS. At the next screen for naming the VM and placing the location of system files, make sure the name matches the VMDK image we created earlier. As for the location, I'm placing the files in that temporary folder on the desktop. At the next screen for specifying disk capacity, use the file size we found in V2V Converter. For storing the virtual disk, make sure it's stored as a single file. After clicking Next, we'll get to customizing the virtual hardware for the VM. Clicking the Customize Hardware button, another window pops up. A lot of this will need to be tailored to the PC you're trying to revive. For memory, I gave the system 1GB. For the processor, I kept that at 1 core since the PC was a Pentium 4. For the network adapter, I made sure to make it host only as I do not want this VM connecting online. After those specifications, I closed the Customize window and clicked the Finish button on the Virtual Machine Wizard window. With the new Virtual Machine files created and stored in that temporary folder on my desktop, I opened the temporary folder called Test and copied the file with the VMX extension over to the folder storing the real VMDK image file. This is an addition after I already performed this demo, but it will help others and would have helped me had I known about it sooner. Open the copied VMX file in Notepad. Create a new line in the file and add this text to the file. This will pause the launch of the VM for 5 seconds to access the advanced system options of Windows XP. This will come in handy later. Save the file and close it when done. After I copied the file, I opened VMware Workstation Player again and removed the temporary VM that had our VMX file. Then, I went to add our VMDK image by going to Player, File, Open, and going to the folder that stores our converted VM image and VMX file. I selected the VMX file, and the virtual machine should have been loaded in the left pane of the program. I selected the virtual machine and pressed the green play button in the right pane. For me, there was a pop-up for a device not found when booting up the VM. I clicked No, and the VM began to boot with the familiar Windows XP splash screen. Unfortunately, we won't be able to get too far because a screen will pop up asking for proc activation. Fortunately, there is a temporary workaround, but it can be confusing and aggravating to others. After clicking No on the product activation, at the account screen, I set the system to restart. At this point, you'll need to have your fingers on the FA key of your keyboard. When the virtual machine gets to the VMware boot screen, start pressing the FA key until you see the Windows Advanced Options menu. If you add the delay line to the .vmx file from earlier, you should have 5 seconds to perform this. If you do not get this screen, you'll have to restart the VM again. At the Advanced Options menu, using your arrow keys, navigate up to the option for Safe Mode, followed by your operating system. The VM should now boot to the Accounts menu. 
make sure to click yes on a window that checks to see if you want it to boot into safe mode. Depending on your experience, you may also have some pop-ups for found new hardware. Just cancel those windows for now. In safe mode, we need to enter a command in the command prompt. Go to start, all programs, accessories, command prompt. In the command prompt window, we need to type in this specific command that will call the OOBE command or out of box experience that allows us to use XP without booting into safe mode all the time. This command basically resets the 30 day use period before needing a proc key. The OOBE command will have to be re-entered every 30 days in order to use this VM. After entering the command, the VM will need to be restarted for the command to take effect. After restarting the VM without having to mash the F8 key, the VM should boot into Windows or at least the account selection screen if you have multiple accounts. Now that the VM is running, we need to optimize it to make it run better and preferably to get it out of the default 640x480 resolution. To do this, we need to run something called the VMware Tools ISO that provides the drivers and services needed to make the experience more stable. In the app window, go to Player, Manage, Install VMware Tools. If nothing popped up on screen for you like me, we'll need to go to the emulated DVD drive in the VM. Go to Start, My Computer. In the Explore window, find the D drive or the DVD drive and click on it. On this screen, select the IAM setup.exe. For me, the setup program failed to run. Your experience may be different. So I had to add the install VMware tools process again. On my second try, the program ran properly. At the VMware tools setup screen, after selecting next, I selected the typical installation method from the three choices. On the next screen, I selected the install button and let the software install. For me, this only took a few minutes and got a couple error windows along the way. When the install was finished, I closed the window and allowed for the software to restart my VM. Again, after rebooting, everything appeared the same as before, but this time, after double clicking on the window, the window adjusts the VM's desktop to fit my monitor screen. With the installation of VMware tools, we can also add and remove peripherals from the host machine. In this example, I connected a flash drive with a text file to my host machine. I then mounted it to my XP VM to access it. This is useful if you need to recover files or add files to a piece of software in the VM. From here, the virtual machine is pretty much ready to use if you need to recover a file, use some software that was on the device, or just keep in the machine for a virtual keepsake. But before finishing the video, I need to go over the limitations of what we produced here. The first and biggest limitation is the longevity of the virtual image. From earlier, we had to input the OOBE command in safe mode to use the virtual machine without the product activation screen on every restart. This command only allows the virtual machine to run uninterrupted for 30 days until product activation appears again. What's more concerning though is that the OOBE command only works three times over around 90 days and will stop working altogether. I've tried looking for other methods and registry hacks to get around it, but this is only a temporary solution. A permanent solution is having a genuine proc key and activating it. I'll post a link in the description of a person using the phone activation service used in 2022. It worked for me, but I can't guarantee that Microsoft will keep the service running in the future. The workaround for this limitation without relying on product activation are the copies of the VMDK and VHD images that we saved from earlier. I found that removing the old VMDK image with a new copy doesn't corrupt the setup we have with Workstation Player. But you'd have to go back through the steps of redoing the OOBE command in safe mode and reinstalling VMware tools again. The second limitation is the potential for corrupted programs. This may not be the case for every physical to virtual conversion, but it can occur. For example, in my VM, I was trying to play Ski Free when I got an application error pop-up that forced closed my game. The same error occurred on another game in this VM. While these were the only two programs that had this issue, this would have been a problem if these were programs I was trying to keep in production. I tried using the command prompt to try and fix this, but to no avail. 
One potential fix for other users in this situation will be finding an ISO image of Windows XP as a repair disk to fix the issue. I was able to find a copy of my OS by searching archive.org. It didn't work for me though, and I can't guarantee it'll work for others, but I should at least put that out there. The last limitation that I have come across is software proc key errors based on hardware changes. Like the first limitation I brought up, it's the same issue regarding any software that required a proc key being activated online and tied to system hardware. The example in my VM is a copy of Office 2003 not allowing full use to the software activation believing the hardware assigned to the proc key has changed. Here, I don't have a good workaround for this issue unless you have the original software and want to reinstall it in the virtual machine. Besides those limitations, this guide should help anyone that needs to recover a dead XP machine if they're down on their luck. It helped me over the past few years, and I've also applied this guide to newer versions of Windows as well. If it would assist others, I could also produce videos on those as well. I'll also try to answer questions in the comments, but my response time isn't the best. So, that'll do it for me in this video. This is Steve signing off, and stay safe everyone.